This is CNN Breaking News. And we are following more breaking news out of Tokyo this morning. A Japan Airlines passenger jet with nearly 400 people on board. You see it landing there with a the fireball on its wing. It collided with the Japan Coast Guard aircraft on its way to help with earthquake relief efforts. Japan's public broadcaster now reporting five crew members on that Coast Guard plane have been killed. The captain is in critical condition. Now, video shows the commercial plane igniting into a fireball barreling down the runway this morning. The airline says nearly everyone from that flight was safely evacuated. Japan's public broadcaster says 17 passengers were injured. And this was the panicked scene inside the plane as smoke filled the cabin and passengers scrambled to find a way out. CNN's Will Ripley joins us live from Tokyo. And Will, I just want to talk about the crew, actually. We'll get to the evacuation efforts. Um, but the crew who died, they were on their way to help, correct? Can you give us more? Yeah, so this uh, Haneda Airport is right in the heart of Tokyo, about 20 minutes from where I'm standing right now. And there's also a Coast Guard base nearby. The whole airport actually sits right on the bay. It's a beautiful uh, approach when you fly in there. It's probably my favorite airport when I fly into Tokyo. My cameraman, John, uh, flew in there just a few hours before this happened. Um, but in this case, this, this Coast Guard aircraft somehow ended up on the same runway as uh, this uh, Japan Airlines jet was flying in, a packed plane coming from the tourist hotspot of Sapporo uh, in northern Japan. And these two planes had an incredibly fiery collision. Uh, we know that, uh, according to NHK, Japan's national broadcaster, uh, five crew members were killed. The captain was able to escape, uh, but he is currently being held uh, are currently on life support. Um, I've also lost my IFB signal, so let's not ask a follow-up question until I get reconnected. Uh, but, but what we know is that uh, this, this, this Coast Guard plane uh, was headed uh, to assist with the earthquake relief efforts that within hours of the new year, there was a 7.5 magnitude quake that rocked to the central western coast of Japan. I know um, we're going to talk more about that in a moment. There's the number of dead in the dozens right now. But what is truly extraordinary is that what could have been a horrific mass casualty situation uh, was was averted uh, because in a matter of seconds, despite the fact uh, that passengers say the rear and middle exits of this aircraft were damaged in this collision, there was a fire rapidly engulfing the plane. And yet everybody, 367 passengers, eight uh, children under the age of two included uh, on the passenger list. So a lot of parents, they're you know, clutching onto their young babies uh, and these 12 crew members, they all were able to make it off of that aircraft safely. All right, Will Ripley, we do have follow-up questions. We're going to ask you when you're plugged back in over the course of the next hour as we keep an eye on the breaking news from on the ground. In the meantime, former FAA safety inspector and CNN safety analyst David Susi is here. So first, walk us through what happens in an emergency situation like this on the runway because there was not a mass casualty event, uh, event right? Essentially, this is right. when things go well. It's truly miraculous. And the fact that there were two exits actually blocked and not able to be used really, really made this a, a miraculous event to be able to get everybody off of there. So what happens at this point is everybody, they, they de uh, deployed the slides so that everybody could get out quickly. And it, it really is amazing that that many people got out of there so quickly. They, they you, you channel out, you go to your nearest exit, as they always tell you when you get on the airplane, look for your nearest exit, it may be behind you. This is what they did. They were aware, they were, they were conscious, they were ready for any kind of accident and this crew is amazing that they got everybody out of there so quickly by just channeling them through the through, through the aisles. There's already smoke. If you can visualize this, there's smoke in the cabin at the time. There may be fire going on at the time. People are es uh, getting out these exits and jumping onto the slides and coming out to the uh, out to the ramp. And then once they clear that, they have to get away. So this is all an incredibly urgent situation and to have someone be, to be able to manage it, a crew to be able to manage it and get them all out of there safely uh, is really testament to the work that they did to prepare for this type of, uh, of tragedy. Yeah, David, to, to, to that point, there's preparation and then there's action. A and the former, you can do whatever you want in the lead up to, the latter is what really matters. And when you look at the pictures from the landing where the wing was clearly on fire to just how quickly the entire flame or the entire plane was engulfed. You see it there. I mean, it looks like it's almost cracked in half yeah. with the flames crawling up the windows. Yeah. How much of a time window did they have here? Uh, it's, it's seconds. I mean, it, it just within about two minutes, everybody was 
uh, up and out of their seats and starting to, ex to exit. Uh, here's the, the issue with this and the reason that it came so quickly is the fact that it was a solid enough hit or collision that not only the tip of the wing hit, but the structure, the spar, the main wing spar is cracked. You can tell that that happened because the fuel cells go through there and the connections to the fuel cells are in the fuselage of the aircraft underneath where people are sitting. So when that hit and it pulled that wing back, it obviously ruptured some fuel cells or at least some fuel attachments and that started pouring fuel into the area. It com combined that with some winds that were going on at the time too, and that can spread the fire much more rapidly. So we are talking about just seconds to be able to react, to be able to get out of there, leave your personal belongings behind and get out of that airplane as quickly as possible. David, as a safety inspector, former safety inspector, can you talk about what are the next steps in terms of an investigation? What are the things that people will start to look at? Well, there's some things that you can jump to conclusions about, and we want to make sure as an investigator you don't do that. We, we need to look first at what happened, and it's too early to assign blame to anybody or anything like that. But what we can conclude is that you, we know that the Coast Guard was, was heading out to, to provide relief to the earthquake victims. We know that they were in a hurry to get out and do that. They were moving. The, if you look at how busy that airport is, that's a very, very active airport. There's a lot of moving pieces, and we talk about this a lot in the United States. We've had a really large increase in the number of near misses and runway incursions, uh, such as this one. Uh, but the, we haven't had a fatality. We haven't had anything like this one so far in the United States. But we're, the FAA has started a panel to investigate these types of incidents. So where I would start with this investigation first is the communications, uh, the communications between who said what to whom. And as you know, there's been a lot in the United States. One of them most recently was where the air traffic controller had said, go ahead and go on to runway 17 left, or I, I don't know exactly which one it was. And when the pilot repeated that back to confirm, he said, something different, like 17 right. And the air traffic controller was busy, fatigued, had worked several shifts, and then uh, said it back, it didn't recognize the fact that he didn't get the message properly. And then that airplane taxied onto an active live runway where there was an airplane landing. So these types of communications are something that's under close scrutiny right now with the FAA in the United States and also uh, in Europe uh, and, and in Japan. We have to really look at how this is happening. As these airports get busier and busier and busier, you still have a human being trying to figure out what I call the fourth dimension. It's not only where the airplanes are, but where will they be if they make a mistake or if even if they do what they're supposed to do, where will they be in the future and do those times intersect with each other? And so it's an extremely difficult job. And uh, we're, I hope that it improves. We really have a lot of efforts going forward to improve that over the next year or two with the FAA at least and in the international community. David, thanks for this insight.